that camera angle is not going to work. <laughs> hey, it's Carrie, back with another video. More books that I read. I realize I'm getting so far behind that I really just need to bite the bullet and get through a whole bunch of books all at once. I think I'm on like page three of my Goodreads <laughs> right now because I'm that far behind. So, without further ado, more books that I have read recently. Um, the first one is Unenchanted. And this is a book by Chanda Han. I believe that's how you say her name. I gave it four out of five stars. It is, it is YA. Um, it's about a girl who is a descendant of the Grimm brothers. And she is trying to solve the mysteries and defeat all of the Grimm tales so that her family is no longer cursed. And I was very kind of like... Uh, so close to putting it down at the beginning of the book because it was sort of like YA tropey and it was really annoying. Like, most popular boy in school is dating this annoying ditzy cheerleader and, you know, this girl that we're following, she's so incredibly awkward and nobody likes her and then suddenly the boy is interested in her. I would ask that if you do start to read this book, just push past that because it does get better. And it's one of those where at the end of the book those icky kind of tropes at the beginning that would normally make someone like put down a book just because they don't want to read those characters they're not interested in them at all it turns out that that was part of the effect of whatever this girl is going through and yeah it does end with her like finishing the little red riding hood story at a school dance wearing a gorgeous red gown like there are parts of it that are very predictable <laughs> but i think overall it worked and like I said, I gave it four to five stars. I was pleasantly surprised by what I got. So I would at least give it a chance. Next book that I read is called Sweet Filthy Boy. And it's by Christina Lauren. And I gave this four out of five stars as well. This is a dirty romance with a very believable couple. Like these two meet in Vegas and they get married on a whim with two of their friends. And so you can kind of tell, like, they're going to be, like, books two and three in the series are her two friends and their love stories with the other two guys. But um, these guys get married on a whim. And our main couple, I don't know any of the names of these people. I'm just going to be giving you brief overviews of the stories because this is really far back in my reading already. Um, this couple, like I said, they get married on a whim. And... They're like, well, of course we have to get divorced. She's thinking, well, of course we have to get divorced. Like, this was so stupid. Why did we do this? And he's fighting against it. He's like, no, I I don't feel like we should. I feel like, you know, this happened for a reason. Blah, blah, blah. He's going back overseas to wherever he lives. I believe it was in France. Um, and he says, you know what? It's time for a change in your life. She's got some kind of big dramatic thing going on in her life. And he says, well, I live in France, you know, we're married, why don't you just come with me for the summer? I think maybe this is before she starts college. Um, he's like, come live with me in France for the summer. Be my wife, live a little bit, and then maybe work your mind out because she's going through some, like, emotional, like, life drama stuff. And they end up having this, like, incredibly awkward sort of meeting. Like, he invites her to France, she says, no, I can't, which is what you'd expect. And he begins to expect it, too. So when she shows up at the airport, he's just like, I didn't think you would actually come. <laughs> and there's there's this incredibly awkward sort of back and forth that they have at the beginning of this marriage relationship thing that they're trying to build. And it's it was very real to read. I really enjoyed how the author did that because I thought it was a very sort of accurate portrayal of a really awkward couple. Like, I could feel it. I could feel the awkward coming off the page. <laughs> the next book that I read, where is it? It is actually a paper book. I haven't, I don't read many of those now, I'm sitting on my shelf back behind me, or back behind the computer. Um, it is the third book in the Gail Women series by Tanya Huff. It is called The Future Falls. And um, y you would definitely have to read the first two books to even know what's going on with the story. And like, the writing style, she's very good at writing things sort of hinting at world building. So it does take some getting used to her style of writing. Luckily, I had already read two books. So I kind of know what she's doing with it. And I kind of know what already goes on with these characters. But we're, inter we're brought back into the same world as the characters that we already know and love. It was such a good third book. And the whole time you're like, you're rooting for this couple 
who is, they're just doomed to failure. Like, there's no way that they're ever going to be together. The boy is 17, and the girl is 30... I forget what it is. 34? <laughs> I mean, it's... They're, like, 13 years apart. Whatever that math is. 31. So, they're never going to be together. The family has a rule that relationships have to be within seven years. And... So the girl is much older, and she's like, we can't do this, and the boy is much younger, and it's it's really creepy and, like, cringy. Obviously, it's not supposed to happen, but, like, you can't help but, like, root for them the entire time. It is such a weird family dynamic. There's other really cringy aspects in this particular story, but I won't get into it, obviously, because there's spoilers, <laughs> but I would definitely recommend reading the series. I really liked it. I gave that one five out of five stars. <laughs> it was so good. Next book that I read... I actually read City of Bones by Cassandra Clare, and I was pleasantly surprised with what I got. I gave this four out of five stars as well. Um, I was, I, there are YA tropes in it. I, I went into this book knowing virtually nothing about it. I have read the Infernal Devices series, Clockwork Angel, Clockwork Prince, Clockwork Princess. I have read those three, and so I'm kind of familiar with the world and the magic, but it's different in this book, obviously. Um... And so I, adjust my hand, I was kind of familiar with it going into it, but I knew nothing about the characters or the storyline or what happens in there. So I was surprised to see like our main character showing up at like a really high society, not high society, like a really like goth club downtown, people with funky colored hair and piercings and stuff like that, like. I don't know why, but that just surprised me, like, from what I understood of the main character beforehand, which was, like, virtually nothing. I didn't anticipate that particular part of the story coming in, and then, like, there's a potential gay storyline for the future. I don't know. I'm not giving you, like, a synopsis of what the book is about. Obviously, that's easy enough to read out on Goodreads, and most people have read the book already anyway. But yeah, I did like our main character. I'm not sure how I feel about the twist at the end of the book. I mean, it's kind of like, oh, I've never actually read a book that ended up like that, but okay. All right, we'll see where this goes. I did add the second book to my to-read list, but it's it's like way down in the list. Like, I'm, it's not going to be anything that I get to anytime soon, but yeah, I thought it was good. I mean, not fabulous reading, not fabulous writing by any, by any means. Like, no offense to Miss Cassandra Clare, but I'm sure her writing gets better <laughs> over the years. Um, I did like the Infernal Devices series, so I have high hopes for this series and where it's going to go. Hopefully it's not too YA tropey where I eventually just get fed up with it, but I'm liking this so far, which kind of surprised me. Um, next book that I read is called Wallbanger, and it is by Alice Clayton, and I gave it four out of five stars. And again, it's a dirty romance with a sort of, like, relatable couple I do like their interactions. I feel like they're very funny, but there's just, there's a few things that I didn't like. One is this woman, our main character, she puts up with her neighbor next door who sleeps with like so many different women and they all have these really weird quirks. Like one girl actually meows while she's having sex. The other one likes to be spanked like thoroughly and like really aggressively. And the third one giggles the whole time <laughs> so reading about that was hilarious because our main character has such a unique voice such a funny internal dialogue it's so good the author must have had a blast writing this um, but our main character she refers to her orgasm as the o the o is gone the o left the building she's not coming back like apparently it's been like six months or nine months, or something weird like that, where her O, she had a very traumatic experience with a one-night stand, and her O just disappeared. She hasn't had an orgasm since, like, even self-inflicted. That's probably not the right way to phrase that, but yeah. So, I, I get it the first couple times the author did it, referring to it in that way, but it got annoying after a while, because she continues to refer to it that way. Our main character is talking about the O, and the O is up on a pedestal, and it's this this beautiful red-haired woman, and she's she's going away. I can't get to her. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> and then there was a scene at the end of the book where our two main characters, I mean, it's a dirty romance, sexy romance, so like eventually they get together, and our two main characters 
have this like sex marathon overnight where it's like, you know, 4 p.m., 8 p.m., 11 p.m., 1 a.m. Just like, seriously, people, where is the bucket of cold water I can just <laughs> throw on you? Because I understand maybe you've gone six months without, but you're really you're telling me that there's no chafing involved in this at this point in time there's no like it pulled muscles there's no broken bones like what the hell people that felt a little unnecessary and it was actually uncomfortable for me to read this was an audiobook but i just like can i just skip this part <laughs> like i get it <laughs> they're having a lot of sex since <laughs> ugh i was over that book but like I said, I did like the internal dialogue of our main character and their interactions together, aside from that sex marathon, were actually genuine, and I, I liked them a lot. I would recommend it. Next two books that I read are the first two books in the Arcana Chronicles series by Cressley Cole. First one is called Poison Princess. The second one is called Endless Night. And I gave the first one four stars, and the second one five stars. And it is such a hard book. <laughs> the first book is so difficult to try to explain, um, like, concisely. I noticed this when I was trying to type up my Goodreads review for these books. I'm just like, how the hell do I summarize <laughs> what's going on in this book? Okay, so our main character is a girl. She was in an insane asylum because she's having these visions and she's got these sort of latent powers and they think she's crazy. Okay, turns out she's not crazy. She's getting out of school, or she's getting out of the asylum, and she's going back to school at the beginning of the year. She's going back to her boyfriend and her friends and everything like that. And then shortly after entering school, you know, she meets this handsome stranger who he went he used to go to an old school, but now the bridge is open in town, so these kids from the other school that are right on the edge of their district, now it's closer for them to go to this school with everybody else. So there's a bunch of new students this year. And she meets the boy from... The wrong side of the river. That cliche is right on the head. Um, and they start to have this little flirtatious thing. And I really wish the narrator could do a French accent because it's like French Cajun. And I, oh, I, it would have been so good if those lines from him, like the accent was there, or if the few French things that are thrown in, if they were said in the correct French accent. I can't speak French, I but I know what a French accent is supposed to sound like. And that wasn't it. Um, Okay, so she meets the new boy. It's kind of cute, flirty, whatever. Um, she's got her powers, her secret, like, thing in the back of her head where she's like, okay, don't do anything weird because they're going to think you're crazy again. And then all of a sudden, the apocalypse happens. And the entire world is gone, and, like, basically everybody died. And it's, uh, the sky is, like, raining fire and everything like that. And it's, okay, well, all right, that happened. Now what do we do? Um, at the very beginning of the book, there's a scene where our main character, we realize after a while that it's her, she's telling her story to a man whose house she entered, this man who su survived the apocalypse, and we're getting her dialogue where she's just sort of like really sad because hello, her whole family and all of her friends died, like basically the entire town, the entire world died, <laughs> and she's telling this man... And we're getting his internal dialogue, and he's thinking about tying her up in the basement and torturing her and, like, killing her and having his fun with her. Like, oh, it was so creepy. <laughs> okay, so the apocalypse happens, and then, like, that was at the very beginning, so we don't know what's going on. And then she tells the story of going back to school, meeting the boy, and then every once in a while we flash back to her. She's still telling the story to that creepy guy. Turns out the apocalypse happened because... Our girl is one of the arcana cards, like the tarot cards, and she is the empress, and she's fighting in a battle like the Hunger Games against all these other teenagers across the country. I think it's just the country. Maybe the world, no, because the guy who plays the death card, or the guy who is the death card, he's won the last couple arcana games. I think that's what they call them. Um... He's won the last couple battles. Like, you have to play until there's only one card left, only one player left. So it's like the Hunger Games. It is, it's exactly like that, but it's so hard to summarize. The Death card has won the last several games, and so he's basically immortal. And I think he was originally from Europe because he does have a sort of um, German accent, I think. I don't know. This book is, it sounds really freaking weird. And it, reading it was a little odd. 
but I loved it so much. I had to go on and read the second book right away. And like I said, I gave the second book a five out of five stars. It is so intriguing, but also like really weird. <laughs> and I'm excited to see kind of what happens with these characters. I'm not a fan of like how the characters have ended up at the end of the second book, like with this little love triangle that's going on with them. We shall see what happens, but I will not say anything further because everybody should go and read it. Next book that I read is called A Study in Brimstone, and it's by G.S. Denning. Um, I gave this four out of five stars. It is a sort of reimagining of the original Sherlock Holmes stories where our main character is an idiot, but he's like a lovable, sort of heartwarming, charming like warlock. He can do magic and stuff, and he's really good at detecting spells and like casting spells, and he's, he's good at that, but the brains of the operation is John Watson, who's following him around. And I'm a big fan of the show Sherlock, and I've read the original stories, most of them anyway. Um, and I like the twist on it. There are parts of it that were confusing, and that I'm just like, eh, that was okay. But I, I like the fact that they tweaked the original and gave us this new sort of spin on it. I don't think I'm going to read on in the series right away, but I thought it was very good. Next book that I read is called The Isle of the Lost, and it is by Melissa de la Cruz, and it is the inspiration for the story, or the, the TV show, The Descendants on Disney Channel, about all the descendants of the Disney villains. And it was cheesy, and it was sort of, like, predictable. <laughs> there were parts of it, you could tell it's a middle grade audience that they're writing to like there are parts of it I'm just like the characters are questioning this like we just talked about this like two pages ago and like half an hour ago for the characters like why don't they remember that this happened clearly this guy is supposed to do this like there were parts of the book that were like that the names of the characters are just like like nailed it right on the head like Mal is the daughter of Maleficent, and Carlos is the son of Cruella. Like, the names are so similar. I wasn't a fan of that, but I get that they did that just so that you can always remember who is who. <laughs> Jay is the son of Jafar, and I thought that was... I mean, there it's charming for what it is and for the audience that it was written for. I can see why it would be appealing, <laughs> so... Um, I don't feel like I'm going to read on. At the end of this book, there is a little tagline that says, you know, to find out what happens next, make sure you watch the show. <laughs> like, I'm not going to watch the show. <laughs> but I do appreciate that it was, you know, it is a charming, cute book, a sort of extension of people for people who are fans of, like, the Disney cartoon movies growing up. Um, and I, a note about the narration, though, the girl who did the narration, I feel like she was the perfect person to pick for that. But if you are going to read this book in audio, I would recommend reading it at like a 1.5 speed. Because of the way that she narrates, I don't know if it's just her personal style, it's very breathy, very exaggerated. And reading it in slower, like at the original speed, got very annoying very quickly. <laughs> Next book that I read is called The Testing. It's by Joelle Charbonneau. I believe that's how you say that. Gave it three out of five stars. Um, it is very similar to The Hunger Games. Um, in this case, children actually want to go to this testing process because those who succeed in the testing will end up going to university. And I kind of like that spin on it. Um, they do test them academically and physically, and there are different, like, they, pity, they pit them against each other and then the characters are sort of, like, surprised that they're being pit against each other. Like, there's only so many spaces, there's only so many people that can go to university and become leaders of this group. And there were parts of it that I liked, and there were parts of it that were so similar to The Hunger Games that I'm just like, really? How did you not get sued for that? <laughs> no, but I, I did think there were parts of it that were appropriately shocking. I think it is supposed to be. Um, you know, when, you know kids start dying in this testing process and like nobody cares the testing people don't care and the other people that are the other kids that are testing they're like are you kidding me somebody just died um like there are parts of it that were good and there are parts that i just didn't like so 
to each their own. That just wasn't the perfect book for me. I did put the second one in my wish list, but I haven't bought it yet. Maybe I'll get to it eventually. Next one that I read was an Audible original. It was one that I grabbed for the month of October, I think. Um, and this was Lullaby by Jonathan Mayberry. And I gave it three out of five stars. It is a very short sort of horror story about a couple living in a haunted house and the presence that is there with them and their baby daughter and just sort of the haunting that occurs while they're there and how they deal with it. Um, I did think it was good, but again, it was very, very short. And I feel like in order to get fully invested in these characters and understand why they're doing what they're doing, I feel like we would have needed more development of their characters, and there just wasn't enough time to do that. Um, but I would recommend it. All right. Next book that I read is called Deja Dead by Kathy Rikes. It's the first book in her Temperance Brennan series, and I was happy to at least get to book number one because I know there's like 20 some books in this series already. I'm like, okay, let's just, let's just start at the beginning. We'll see how it goes because I'm a big fan of the show Bones. I have all 12 seasons on DVD. Love that show. Earlier seasons more than the later seasons, but you know, to each their own. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, I know this, this book series inspired the TV show. So I'm like, I just want to see how similar it is. And the characters, I liked that I had the show in the back of my mind because then I have sort of projections of the different characters in the book. It's not exactly the same. Obviously they change a lot for the series, but I like the fact that our main character is a forensic anthropologist and she's solving cases with the FBI or the Canadian equivalent of the FBI because it does take place in Canada. Um, and I like that she has a best friend who mirrors Angela. Um, there is a character in the lab, a couple characters, one sort of mirrors Zach, the other one sort of mirrors Hodgins. They're not exactly the same. I am more drawn to the characters in the TV show, I think just because I was so attached to that. And part of me was like, no, I want them to match the show <laughs> in the book. And it's just, obviously this is the parent material. So this came first. So I understand why it's different, but part of my brain couldn't help drawing that comparison. Um, I did like the story. Um, it was a fairly lengthy audiobook, and I don't know if it was just because it was a mystery and it's not what I read normally. Um, I mean, I do read mysteries, but it's not, I'm not drawn to detective mysteries in general. I find them kind of dry and I prefer to watch them in like a TV show format to get the mystery story as opposed to reading a book about it. I think it was just a little bit too long to keep my interest for long periods of time. So I did read other books in the meantime, but I did like it and I would recommend it if mysteries are your thing. Next book that I read is called The Thief. And it is by Megan Whalen Turner. And I gave it three out of five stars. And I did like it a lot. I say that because I'm, it's, I didn't like it as much as I thought I would. And it, it's written in kind of an odd way. Our thief, he is released from prison because a man wants him to help steal a gift, a stone, a precious relic that everybody knows because this relic is going to prove to the world that whoever owns it, whoever possesses it, is the one in charge. And then there's going to be no more question as to who rules who rules the world or who rules the kingdom or some such. So they're seeking out this relic that's been lost for the ages and they need this famous thief to go and steal it for them. And we get his story, um, his background, you know, where his name comes from and how he's connected to the other characters and building their relationships with them. But then we also get world building of, you know, the, the kingdom that they're from and sort of the gods and goddesses that they worship and their history. And it's told in like story format, like they're sitting around a campfire at the end of the night and our thief is telling like what he learned growing up. And then the man who released him, he's telling like, oh no, you know, my grandmother told me this. And I thought it was kind of a unique way to write a story, but it strayed I think from what I was more interested in, which was the adventure part of it. I'm like, I don't really care about the, the backstory, the history of this particular country. Like I would rather just find out about, you know, how they get the rock out of the cave. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
So maybe it just didn't hit the right notes for me, and that's fine. It's just my personal taste. So, yeah, I think I'd, I think it would be enjoyable for other people. Just wasn't the right book for me at that time. All right, let's keep going. The next book that I read is called The Lying Game, and it is by Sarah Shepard, and I gave this four out of five stars. And it makes sense that I can compare it to Pretty Little Liars <laughs> because she also wrote that series. It is very similar in terms of tone, like how it's written and how the characters are portrayed and sort of the dynamic that they have as a group. It totally feels the same as Pretty Little Liars. <laughs> Um, this is about a set of twins where they're meeting up for the first time, but before they actually meet, the one twin goes missing. And so when the other one shows up, nobody realized that they were twins. Um, just the two of them knew that they were going to be meeting, and they were going to surprise everybody. Well, okay, so the one twin goes missing, and the other twin shows up and just decides to sort of play along and take her place when people start mistaking her for her twin. And it's thinking of, you know, how figuring out where her twin went, first of all, and then sort of learning the secrets of her friends. And I thought it was done really well. I'm not doing a very good job of explaining it, but I thought it was done really well. There is a mystery involved um, because not only are we following our main character who took the place of her twin and is pretending to be her with all of her friends, um, but we're getting the inner dialogue of the twin who is missing, turns out she died. <laughs> She's a ghost and she's following her twin around as she takes her place and remembering things about her friends and reminiscing, sort of. And it was such an interesting way to read a book. Um, but yeah, very similar to Pretty Little Liars. I can see why. Um, oh, uh, I can see the comparisons between the two, the similarities, they're definitely there. <laughs> but yeah, I would recommend it. I thought it was really good. Sorry, I'm scratching my arm and this makes the whole camera move. <laughs> Next book that I read is called Practical Demon Keeping and it is by Christopher Moore. And I gave this three out of five stars. I thought it was gonna be really, really interesting and funny and good. Unfortunately, it didn't quite hit the mark for me. Sorry, my nose is itchy. Um, there are parts of it that were so interesting and so funny. Um, basically, we're following around a human who's tied to a demon who can't die, and he's, you know, indebted to this human for the rest of his life and has to do what he says. And um, we're also following, like, the different characters that our human runs into and figuring out, like, who is connected to who because... There's little storylines throughout the course of the book, and then at the end, everything sort of wraps up together, and you're like, oh, the person from that storyline is the granddaughter of this other person, and our human and the demon are connected to this person over here because he ate his neighbor. Like, those connections are sort of, like, obscure. <laughs> and I liked reading the individual stories, but I don't know if maybe this was just not the right time for me to read this book, but I had a hard time, like, focusing on the main part of the storyline and just being interested in it. It just didn't didn't quite do it for me. But it had a lot of promise. It just it didn't deliver for my taste at the time. Um, next book that I read is called Three Dark Crowns by Kendar Blake and I gave it four out of five stars. It follows three sisters, triplets, who were separated at age seven, I think. Um, they're each gifted with these abilities at birth and when they reach the age of seven I think that's when they start to manifest these abilities and then they're separated and then they are raised by the other members of their family who have the matching ability and these kingdoms are sort of kept separate and only one of the sisters can eventually rule the entire country kingdom such uh, maybe it is just one kingdom, but the three groups are split up into like different corners of the kingdom. So then when the daughters, when the sisters ascend, they will battle each other and only one of the sisters will take the crown. So I really like the setup of it and it it was kind of difficult to follow when you start getting into the secondary characters, the supplementary characters. I can, I can keep the three sisters straight, that's fine, although... 
between the two of between two of them I had trouble like keeping straight the powers that they have because they don't always like use their power in the storyline and so that was kind of like okay I don't remember is that the one that can talk to animals or is that the one that's good with plants <laughs> like or elements or whatever it was the the poisoner sister I could keep straight because hers was the very first storyline that we got and then after that I don't know if it was just there was a lot going on, a lot of characters, a lot of world building, which I, I like. I did enjoy the story a lot, but it was a lot to take in, a lot to learn, and I think maybe it would take another read through of the book for me to get everything down. <laughs> um, but I would be fully open to doing that because I really enjoyed the book. <laughs> Next book that I read is a paper book, and it's over here in this little stack. There it is. It's in that stack over there. Um, it is called The Clairvoyant of Kale Ocho. Kaye Ocho, I may be saying that wrong, by Anjanette Delgado, and I gave it three out of five stars. It is a woman who has the ability to speak to the dead, communicate with the dead, and she is having an affair with her downstairs neighbor who is married, and all of a sudden her neighbor ends up dead, and the world finds out, or her little world, her little corner of the world finds out that she was having the affair and she gets pulled into the police investigation and she's also able to communicate with the man who died and they're trying to figure out who who murdered him or how he died. Because we know that she didn't do it, she knows that she didn't do it, but everybody suspects that she did it because she was in the perfect position to do so, you know what I mean? It was, it definitely had a cozy mystery feel to it and I did enjoy it. Um, it reminds me kind of of Victoria Laurie's books. I have both of her series, and she deals with a main character who has a psychic ability, which I like. That was why I picked up this book. Again, I gave it three out of five stars. It was good, but I don't plan on rereading it. That's why it's in the stack of books that are going to go. <laughs> Next book that I read is called Fool, and it's by Christopher Moore, another book by him. He also wrote in Practical Demon Keeping. I gave this one, though, five out of five stars. I would absolutely recommend that everybody read this book. It is told from the perspective of King Lear's Fool, and it's a retelling of the events of King Lear with little hints at, like, other Shakespeare plays thrown in there. Oh, it was so funny. <laughs> and I don't know if maybe it's just because I was an English major in college and I have an appreciation for Shakespeare's work. Not that anybody who wasn't an English major couldn't have an appreciation for Shakespeare's work, but I feel like I actually enjoy reading Shakespeare. <laughs> And, like, I took an entire class on Shakespeare, and, like, we talked about all the plays, and I love language in general. I think maybe that just is because I was an English major. Reading, writing, love it. Um, I love the language in this book. I love the jokes. The humor is so funny. It's so dirty, <laughs> like, naughty, but it's so good. And it's very crude and in-your-face, but oh, it's so, so good. Like, I finished this book. There were parts of this book I was just laughing out loud, which was not good because I was at my desk at work and I'm not supposed to be, like, disturbing the people that I sit next to. But, oh, I have, I was, like, sending quotes to my one coworker that sits very near me. I'm just like, oh, my God, they just said this. There was a line about Odin's dangling ovaries. <laughs> and I just, I had to pause and giggle and, like, a tear was rolling down my cheek. I'm just like, oh, my God. <laughs> This was the exact right book for me to read at the exact right time. It just hit the spot for me. That was such a good book. <laughs> um, but you do read the reviews and like not everybody enjoyed it. They felt like it wasn't, you know, good. It wasn't well done. I disagree. I felt like it was very well done. So to each their own. Next book that I read is called The Fifth Wave and it's by Rick Yancey. And I gave this one three out of five stars. It is a YA book, post-apocalyptic, where most of the world has died and we are seeing what the remaining citizens are doing to survive. And it's a, a girl trying to get back to her brother. Her brother was captured. I think this is aliens. That's what it is. Aliens come to the planet. They take over, kill most of the planet, and then they subjugate the others. They're bringing them into camps and forcing them to work. And this is about like the first, second, third, fourth waves getting up to this point. 
Now people are separated into camps. There's very little resistance at this point and what is happening in the camps. And it was not a pleasant book to read. There are parts of it that were very good. Um, I did like, for example, the romance, which is uncommon for me in YA. I think I'm getting to the point where I'm just sort of like over YA romance because it's so cheesy and so overdone and you can predict everything that's going to happen. I didn't mind it in this book because it made sense to me. Um, and I liked that aspect of the story as opposed to like the soldier warfare aspect of the book where we're talking constantly about battle strategies and weapons and that doesn't interest me much at all. And I've sort of, I'm sort of over post-apocalyptic at this point. Like I think there was another book in the list that was also post-apocalyptic and I just skipped it because I'm just like, I can't read another one right away. I'm going to have to come back to it because I'm just not in the mood to read post-apocalyptic now. Um, I thought it was fine. Um, I did like the twist, the sort of twist in the story. And I think I put the second book in my wish list, but I don't plan on continuing on immediately. It was not exactly the right book for me, but there were enough elements in it that I'd want to see what happens to the characters and what happens next in the story. So we'll see. Maybe someday. Next book that I read is called The Queen of the Tearling by Erica Johansson, and I gave this four out of five stars. It is about a young girl who has been hidden away in the woods her entire life because she is the heir to the Tearling throne. And she knows that, or her, her parents, or whoever it was that sent her off into the woods, I forget who it was exactly, they knew that she would be a target of assassins and that her life would be on the line, and... They hid her away until she could come of age and claim her throne. Um, so she, the only proof that she has of her identity, of her existence, is this fancy necklace that she wears. It's the shape of a teardrop, and it is like a bright blue color, and it's magic. Um, so what we're following her as she is rescued from the cabin in the woods. That sounds like a horror story. It's not, I swear. She's rescued and goes on the journey to get back to the castle and she takes over the throne from her crazy uncle who is so ridiculous to read about. I loved reading like how she brings him down a peg <laughs> because he's just like, you don't understand. I deserve respect. And she, she's like, no, you don't. <laughs> that part of it I enjoyed. And I wonder if it's just because I'm, I'm a character driven reader and I really enjoyed how the characters were sort of melted together in this story of like her building this friendship with the guards and like especially the main guard who's like her friend and how she interacts with her uncle and then now now that she's taken over the throne how she's interacting with the neighboring kingdom who had this running deal with her uncle that they're going to share slave labor they're going not share but they're going to take citizens of Tyrling and like indenture them, send them off in slavery to the neighboring kingdom because if they don't, then the neighboring queen will invade the kingdom and take over. So then it's like seeing how our brand new queen takes over and how she interacts with the queen of the neighboring kingdom. <laughs> I thought it was very well done. I can see why people might not like it because it was kind of slow paced, but I thought it was very interesting. I thought there was enough character development in there to keep a person's interest through the book. But like I said, I can see why people might find it a little boring. Next book that I tried to read, and this is my own fault because I didn't realize it was book number two, is called Stolen Magic. And it is by Gail Carson Levine, who I, I love her books. I've read many of her books before. Um, I gave this two out of five stars. I would have liked it, I think, if I had read the first book first. <laughs> this was a book that I got from the dollar store and it was only a dollar. So I'm like, well, even if I don't like it, you know, it's not a big loss at my at this point. Um, that is actually over here on the stack too. Um, I'm gonna be getting rid of that one. I just did not understand what was going on in the story. There were too many author created titles and phrases and you know, too many different things that I was not familiar with that you really have to focus in order to understand what's going on or at least infer what's going on based on context clues. And I think if I had read the first book, that would have been much easier, but I don't own the first book. And at this point I would have to go out of my way to find the first book. 
so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm just going to unhaul the book. It was a beautiful, you know, hardcover book, perfect cover. You know, it had a dragon on it. I'm like, I love dragon stories, but unfortunately it just did not hold my interest. I gave it about 80 pages before I put it down. Just, sorry, it's not for me. Next book is called Four Letter Word, and it's by Jay Daniels, and I gave it three out of five stars. And it is a dirty romance. And I'm looking at the cover, and literally nothing is coming to mind. I couldn't tell you a single thing about... Oh, wait a minute. Is this the one where the guy was a stripper? No, he wasn't a stripper. He worked in porn. I'm going to click on it. I'm going to, like, define my own rules and click on the book so I can open it. Okay. If this is the one. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, it is. So... This girl, all right, go back. <laughs> I just needed a little bitty reminder. Now I have thoughts about this book. This girl is defending her best friend who was dumped by a horrible boy. And she decides to call him up, gets his number, calls him up, rips him a new one, only to find out that she called the wrong number and is now talking to this other guy who has no clue what's going on with her. But she sounds kind of hot. And that was really funny for him. So they start up this sort of like odd conversation, flirting back and forth. Turns out our main character is married. Um, she's going to be separated from her husband who decided that he wanted to get a divorce after I think eight years or something like that. That's a bit of an odd start for her. But um, she starts this flirtation with this guy that she reamed out on the phone. And now I looked at the name so I know what they are. The girl is named Sydney. And the guy is named Brian. And Brian has a secret. He is the one that she royally ripped out on the phone. Um, he really likes Sydney. They start flirting back and forth. You know, he has, um, he had an accident or he caused an accident in the past and he caused the injury of a young boy. And he feels incredibly guilty about this. And so to make up for it, along with owning half of a surf shop with his best friend, he also does porn on the side to make extra money, which he gives to the family of the boy who he injured in the accident. Like, that was very predictable. I could see that coming a mile away. Um, not the porn bit, but that the fact that he's making extra money because he feels guilty about injuring the boy. Like, I could see that. I can understand that. That was fine. The issue that I had... But, I mean, the fact that it's a dirty romance and I didn't remember much about it just from the cover. Um, I had an issue with how the characters spoke about the porn industry. At least, if they were talking only about the company that this guy worked for and, like, the skeezy owner and, you know, the fact that he didn't like at all what he was doing and the owner was horrible and the company was just bad... The way it came across, it sounded like they were talking about the industry in general. The porn industry in general. It's just, it's horrible. Um, our main character, Sydney, she finds out that he's doing this and she calls the girl that he was with a whore or a slut or something like that. And I felt like it was very much author bias at that point. It didn't sound like they were talking about just that case or just that company or that particular video it's not like she ever met this girl in her life before the girl who he was filming with like it's a legitimate business it's a huge business and i i don't know why but that just rubbed me the wrong way <laughs> no pun intended that just it did not sit well with me i didn't like it at all the fact that they're sitting there bashing this you know, multi-million dollar, completely consensual business that's worldwide, and they're sitting there talking about it like they're looking down their noses on it, at it, and just, I don't know, it just, oh, I couldn't, I didn't like it at that point. I made it through the rest of the book because that happened very, like, very much toward the end of it, so I did read the entire book, but that part of it definitely soured it for me, and i was way more eloquent explaining that in my Goodreads review. <laughs> Just, oh, I didn't do a good job of explaining that, but you get it. You get it, I hope. Next book that I read is called Prudence, and it is by Gail Carriger. Carriger? Um, and it, I gave this three out of five stars. It is a steampunk sort of mystery. It takes place in the 1800s, I believe. I'm not going to click on it. I'm not going to click on it. Um, 
we follow a woman who has ties to the vampire community and the werewolf community in her area. I believe this character, she can touch someone who is a werewolf or a vampire and she can take over their powers temporarily. So like if she needs to be a werewolf, she can touch someone who's a werewolf and immediately take away their werewolf ability and take it unto herself. I believe that's the story. I read two stories that were very similar back to back and I really hope this is the one. Um, and she is getting into trouble in her hometown. Her uncle is just like, um, excuse me, lady, you need to be proper little lady and <laughs> learn her etiquette and whatever. And so he gives her an assignment. He's like, you know what? You need to get out of town. You need to go on an adventure and burn off some steam and then come back and be a normal lady. So he gives her a dirigible for her birthday or just as a gift to go on this adventure. She names it the Spotted Custard which is ridiculous. Um, she goes on this adventure with her crew, her best girlfriend, who is very prim and proper and is always looking out for her modesty and her best interest in terms of her reputation. Um, and then she flirts, our main character, she flirts with her head engineer, who is very handsome and charming. And then she also kind of is friends with the geeky brother of her best friend, who she brought along. And he is the um, chief navigator, I believe. He's not the engineer. He's, yeah, I believe he's the navigator. He's in the, the cockpit, like, steering the machine the whole time. He's the captain. Um, I thought the cast of characters was very interesting. I liked sort of the steampunk aspect of it. And the fact that, you know, you mix in the vampires and werewolves. And I thought that was very cool, too. But there were parts of it that just apparently, like, this whole time they were following the mystery of some tea that has special magical properties. I, I feel like the characters, storylines, the world building could have been an entire book in itself without the mystery, the adventure off to discover what's happening with the tea in India. Like, that part of the book got so lost, I was way more interested trying to find out what happens to these characters or like, their characteristics and how they interact with each other. I wanted more of that, um, including the werewolf vampire thing. Like, that would have been so much better instead of this mystery that I I kept getting confused. I'm like, every time they come back to it and we're talking about the characters involved in the mystery, I'm like, what is going on with this again? So I got lost several times in this book, but I enjoyed the characters, so I just kept pushing through. I think... I don't think I'm going to continue on with the series. I was going to say, I can't remember if I put the second one in my wish list or not. I don't think I did. Um, I like the characters, but not enough to continue on at this time. Next book that I read is called A Dirty Job. It's by Christopher Moore. And I gave this four out of five stars. I have read three of his books recently. They all just happen to come up at the same time. I tend to read my books in the order that I purchased them. With a few exceptions, obviously, if I read, you know, several post-apocalyptics in a row, it's going to get so repetitive and I'm just not going to enjoy it at all. So I do mix it up if there's a few in a row that are the same. But for the most part, I read them in order. And it just so happened that a bunch of the Christopher Moore ones were all in the same area of the list. This one follows a man whose wife dies in childbirth and he takes home his baby daughter and a brand new job as a death, what does he call it, a death keep, death dealer, something like that. He can sense objects, objects that glow a bright red because they house a human soul. So he, through trial and error and through awkward moments with people, he learns that when a person dies, an object that was very close to that person can become the, uh, the home for their soul. It will glow bright red, and all he knows is he needs to protect that. Like, he was supposed to get a handbook for this death dealing, this death reaping thing that he does. Somebody else stole the handbook, his coworker who he works with at the shop, she stole the handbook. So he's just flying blind, and he just kind of figures this out on his own, that he's supposed to collect these objects that are glowing red. <laughs> so they all kind of end up at his shop. Um, my favorite part of the book, the, the part that turned it for me, and I'm just like, I have to read the whole thing, was when his daughter, his newborn baby daughter, she, I think she, it's about nine months old, maybe a year old, 
at this point when all of a sudden she discovers that she can say a word out loud. She says the word kitty and someone dies. <laughs> and her dad is obviously freaked out about that. They have to have a discussion. Maybe she's a little older. Maybe she's like three. She's like, honey, you can't say that word. That's a bad word. People die. <laughs> Um, she discovers that she has that ability. Her dad does. Her dad discovers that she can do that. She can kill people with the word kitty. Um, and then all of a sudden, one day, these two massive dogs just appear out of nowhere. What are their names? Mohammed and Alvin, I think are their names. These massive dogs. They're immortal. They can't die. Um, and they're protecting his daughter fiercely. And... <laughs> The amount of things that he goes through, the time he spends, and all the different things that he tries to get the dogs to leave, to kill the dogs, to get rid of the dogs, like, he tries every single thing he can think of. Just nothing happens to these dogs. They are just, oh my god, it was, it was kind of morbid <laughs> listening to him, like, trying to poison these dogs, trying to blow these dogs up, and just nothing happens to them. But it was so entertaining to read <laughs> at that point in the book. I was I was hooked. I'm like, okay, now I need to know what happens in the rest of it. <laughs> and yeah, the rest of the book ended up very good as well. But that part of it was just so entertaining to read. I would definitely recommend it just for that part. Next two books that I read are by Molly Harper. And they're the first two books in the Jane Jameson series. First book is called Nice Girls Don't Have Fangs, and the second book is called Nice Girls Don't Date Dead Men. And the first book was a reread for me. I did read it probably in 2017, early 2017. Um, it is about a woman in Louisiana, I think. She's in the South, and she is turned into a vampire because she runs her car off the road. And then is like stumbling around drunk in the ditch and some guy drives by and thinks that she's a deer and shoots her and kills her. And the guy following behind her, the guy that she met at the bar, turns out he was a vampire. So he turns her to save her. And now she's newly undead and similar to the Sookie Stackhouse books or the True Blood series, TV series, which was inspired by those. Vampires have been outed in the world, like the world knows that they exist. So... Um, in this book, you know, vampires are a common thing. And it talks about her, you know, what to do when she has to go out in the daylight or, you know, how she sleeps or, you know, things that she can't do anymore. She can't eat anything. She has to, like, brush her teeth really well. And, oh, uh, it was so funny. The voice in these books is so good. And it's trying to cope with her new existence as a vampire and also please her incredibly picky and condescending, you know, just hateful sort of family. Her mom and her sister and her grandmother, who are very traditional southern ladies. And um, they don't like the fact that Jane inherited a house from her aunt. Her aunt, who is a ghost, who's still standing around the house, sticking around to keep Jane company. Um... What else happens? Jane has a best friend who's a guy who's a kindergarten teacher. Um, and he ends up dating a werewolf who can't stop eating. Um, and there's just so many little bits of this story. It's so charming. It's so funny. Jane ends up getting a job as a night clerk in an occult bookshop. And she forms a friendship with the elderly owner of the bookshop because he's just fascinated by the fact that she's a vampire. And he's so cute. The old man. Oh. I would definitely recommend reading these books. There's so many, like, charming little bits of these stories. And just rereading the first book and then getting into the second book. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> and then there's obviously a romance, too. The vampire that turned her is now her sire, and he's in charge of her. And they end up forming, like, a relationship. Kind of weird, sort of, does he mean this? Does he mean that? I did enjoy it a lot. I really like these books. I put the third one in my wish list because I'm like, I need to continue on at some point. <laughs> and I am going to, I'm going to stop there. That's enough books for now. I don't even know how many books that is, but that was a lot. Um, yeah, so if you have any comments or thoughts on the books that I talked about, all of the many books, we'll see how many it is. I'll put it in the title. <laughs> um, just leave them in the comments down below. 
Um, or if you want to recommend any books, I'm always looking for good recommendations. I tend to read more audiobooks than anything. I think maybe there was only one or two, maybe two paper books in this entire list. <laughs> um, yeah, just leave them down below. Um, otherwise, I hope everybody is having a fantastic day, and I will talk to you later. Bye!